And a very good afternoon to all my friends out there. Welcome back to Office Hours, the show where I say things. As always, I am your uh, wonderful host, The Professor. Now, last time on the show, we talked about the language family that Chinese belongs to called Sino-Tibetan or less commonly Trans-Himalayan. If you're just joining us now and you're unsure on what a language family is, I would recommend that you check out our previous video because that is a very important concept. Sino-Tibetan still needs a lot of research. Let's write down Sino-Tibetan, but we're fairly sure that it does exist as a concrete language family. This consists of three branches, the Sinitic, otherwise known as Chinese, uh, Tibetan, and the, or, and the, the rather two branches, Sinitic and Tibeto-Burman. And some people would argue about the internal classification of the second branch, but let's leave that for now. So it is quite well accepted as a language family. And all of these languages today are the daughters of a hypothetical ancient language that must have been spoken a long time ago. Even though it was never written down, it's probable, or sorry, it's possible to reconstruct a few words and some simple grammar by comparing the daughter languages, okay? And while we're not quite sure exactly what their language sounded like, we can make an educated guess. So incredibly, the voices of these people actually come alive once again after thousands of years of silence. So who were these people? What was their culture like? So let's take a quick trip back in time, okay, and visit these proto-Sino-Tibetans. So before we uh, jump into the DeLorean, I would like to reiterate that this is only my own highly fanciful imagining. We really have no idea uh, what this culture was like, but we do know about a few cultural concepts that may have existed in their society. Indeed, the culture I'm about to describe may actually be closer to proto-Sinitic or very, very ancient Chinese rather than proto-Sino-Tibetan proper. Uh, Blenchen Post wrote a really good 2013 paper on uh, rethinking proto-Sino-Tibetan phonology from the, or sorry, what was it called? It was called Rethinking Proto Rethinking Sino-Tibetan Philogeny from the Perspective of Northeast Indian Languages. Excellent paper. Excellent paper. And it's a great discussion of how some of the internal classification of Sino-Tibetan as we have it right now doesn't really work. They also argue in this paper that the Proto-Sino-Tibetan community was actually a jungle horticultural or more strictly speaking, arboricultural sago farming community. They, that is, they harvested sago palm trees to get their sustenance. And uh, this is a lot like what some communities in, say, New Guinea do today. So that's one possibility about the proto sino tibetan community. But we're going to talk about something a little... My own vision is, is or my own imagining is a little bit different from that. Uh, so... Now that we've got my disclaimer out of the way, okay, so let's let's get back in our uh, in our in our DeLorean, or you know, I, I'm uh, I'm a uh, very partial to the Wu Tang Clan myself, so if you like, maybe the time traveling elevator, uh, whichever you prefer. But let's head back either way, a long, long time. Now, no one's really sure how long, but it cannot have been more recent than six thousand years. Okay, so at least 6,000 years. Now, however, I think that Blench and Post in their paper, they're more on the money when they estimate eight to 9,000. So let's just compromise, let's say 8,000 years ago, okay? So this was a time before Achilles, a time before the Sphinx. This was a time as far removed from the laying of Sumer's foundation as the time of Caesar from our own. The birth of Christ on this kind of a scale is, is recent. Uh, the halfway points between this time and now were not the days of Christ, but those of Abraham. All right, so we're going back a long, long, long way. And it is in this world that we now find ourselves, okay? So maybe as the, the vertigo of time traveling is wearing off, we find ourselves standing in this lush and verdant mountain valley. And the air is warm and damp, but 
if it's rained this morning, as it very often does in this part of the world, there might be this sweet coolness to the air and fingers of mist may yet brush the very tops of the trees. And looking up, maybe we see the walls of the valley shooting up before us as if taunting us for our puniness. And high, high above in this frozen white stillness, we see the little mountain peaks glimmering and laughing in a world all their own. So, hiking down through the valley, we soon come to this wooden stockade, okay? Probably near a stream, and it's got these terraced gardens going up the hillside. And growing in the fields, we would probably find millets, we would find barley, maybe we would find buckwheat if it was at a high elevation. And maybe, just maybe, like Blench and Post talk about, we would find sago palms. So let's write some of these crops down. Sago, millets, barley, buckwheat. These would have been harvested by Neolithic Asian communities. Rice was probably not on the menu quite yet because that originated in Southeast Asia, near Vietnam and Laos and that kind of area, and that's not where we are right now. So, uh, as, as I say, these are some of the things that we see growing on the terraces and the hillside, and the gardeners we also see, and they're mostly men, and they're going about their work with these adzes, okay? So here's an adz. An adz, it's not quite an ax. It's like a horizontal axe, if you can imagine that. Looks like a hammer, but it's got this kind of flat blade and you use it for digging, kind of like a hoe or yeah, not in the hip hop sense, but in, in, in the, the, the farming sense, a hoe with an E and uh, you know, something, something, something like this. It's like a hoe that you swing down with your hands. So this is an adz, and these would have been made of jade, okay? And, and this is a very precious stone to us. But at this time, it would have been an everyday material that was very useful because it was, it was hard, it was durable, but you could also carve with it. So moving into the village, maybe we pass through the stockade's gate, and maybe it's additionally, there's a fortifications like a ditch or a watchtower. Maybe on the watchtower, uh, we would see a big drum at the top, and that's used maybe for communicating with other villages. And the village itself is this cluster of low huts, maybe some pit shelters. Uh, maybe they'd be made out of bamboo, or as they would have called it, as they would have called it, let's look. Kapoa, kapoa, kapoa is their word for bamboo. So maybe if we see somebody working on his, his, his hut or he working on some, some improvements to, to his house, we would hear him use this word because it means bamboo. Now, some of these huts would be undoubtedly larger than others. And even at this early time, the, the haves and the have-nots would have been emerging as inevitably happens in sedentary cultures. And around the village, maybe we see some kids and dogs or maybe even an occasional novelty, the chicken. Whether or not pigs and cattle would have been domesticated yet is debatable, but if there has been a hunt recently, we might see a few of the pigs and cows less fortunate wild ancestors being butchered. Uh, and, and maybe if we listen to the conversations about these animals of the people around us, we would hear words like, The queen, the queen, the queen, and this is the word for dog. Okay, we would also hear maybe pluck, pluck, and this is the word for pig. And I 
Wa is the word for cattle. So we would hear people talking about the coin or poak or moa to, to, as, as they're interacting with these animals around them. And maybe we can, uh, we, we, we can, we cannot be sure if these words, of course, are 100% correct. But by comparing the words for dog, pig, and cow in languages like Chinese, Tibetan, Burmese, some of the languages of Northeast India, in the daughter languages, that is, we can at least make an educated guess. So when we say these words, tukoyin, plak, wa, pla, when we say these words today, it, it's so cool. We're, we're, we're listening to a faint, faint voice, but still there from the past that's speaking to us across a chasm of 8,000 years. Now, how cool is that? I mean, it gives me chills to think about. In a way, when we say we're uttering the very words that, that we're, we're, we're uttering the very words that they may have spoken and we're conquering this time and distance to befriend people who lived thousands and thousands of years before the pyramids were even conceived. I mean, how cool is that? So that's pretty awesome. Now suppose maybe we meet some people and, and they're nice people and they invite us into their home. And this is maybe we're, we're now in a hut that belongs to a well-to-do family. Dad would be a powerfully built man with an intricately tattooed chest. And at his hip, we'd see a carved and decorated jade ads next to a stone knife. And these are, these are, these are marks of, of one's status as a leader in the community. And around his neck, maybe we would see a jade disc, okay? This jade disc would be a representation of the ever-turning wheel of heaven. And it would look kind of like a CD, but made out of jade, okay? And in their seances, the, this is this is representative of the cosmos and their seances. The shamans of these people climb the cords linking them to heaven and ascend through the North Star, represented here by the hole in the middle of the disc. Okay, and no less of an imposing figure is Mom. She has this ornate headdress that that's um, she has this ornate headdress. And it's fashioned from the skull and the horns and the skin of a goat. And it speaks to the power that she wields both inside and outside the home. For among these people, women are the decision makers of the families. Uh, often, indeed, one woman is the head of several families, for she may have more than one husband, a custom that is still practiced in remote Himalayan communities today. Now, as they welcome us into their home, we're handed cups of what they would call the flat one, or in Proto-Sino-Tibetan, reconstructed Proto-Sino-Tibetan, Sla. Sorry. Sla. Sla. And, and as we're drinking our sla, which really means, again, the flat one, um, we, we, we recognize uh, 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 in the name a reference to the shape of the leaves that are used in its production, okay? And as we start to drink, we recognize a familiar taste, that of green tea. So... Thanking our friends for their hospitality, we return to our own time, finding ourselves on the bustling streets of modern Shanghai. As we walk down Nanjing Road toward the Bund, we begin to recognize echoes of an almost unfathomably distant past. And this time of year, it's quite hot in Shanghai, so let's stop into a Starbucks for a break. I like Starbucks. And here we see that Sla, of course, is still enjoyed and still known by the same name in modern Chinese, albeit with a different pronunciation. In modern standard Chinese, Sha, Sla, Cha, so you can see the resemblance. 
Okay, and as we approach the barista to order, we can't help but notice that around her neck, there's hanging a jade disc. Now, being an American, of course, I want to order a cafe Americano, or in, uh, in Chinese, Meisher Cafe. Now, let's take a look at this name. The first uh, word in this name is Mei, so... May, from Meisher Cafe, May. Now, this symbol, May, means beautiful. So taking a closer look at this, uh, this symbol, or, or in Chinese we would say this Hanzi, we see a person with arms outstretched. Here we have a, a little person with arms outstretched. Maybe this person was shamanizing. I, I don't know, that's how I imagine it. But the really cool thing is, uh, this person is wearing a goat headdress. This is a uh, th th this is a, a representation of a goat or a sheep. So it's a person, arms outstretched, with a dead goat on their head. So uh, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And as we know from our time traveling adventure, the dead goat headdress would have been a highly prized adornment. Hence, we have this meaning for beautiful. Now it's also. Uh, a symbol very familiar to me because it's used in the Chinese name of my home country, Meguo or America. So whenever I go into a Chinese Starbucks and order my Americano, I am paying a silent tribute to this Stone Age fashion statement. How cool is that? So as the barista hands us our coffee, we notice something familiar around her neck, and we notice this jade pendant, right? And, and just like dad wore back in the village. And speaking of dad, we now realize the origin of the Hanza, which again, remember, is, is, is the Chinese name for their writing, the Hanza for dad. Fu, which is really, just a pictograph of a hand grasping a stone adze. Uh, another really cool Hansa that echoes back to the extremely distant Neolithic past is this one. Sorry, that order was wrong. Um, but this 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 Hansa is one. And it means culture. The original meaning of this Hansa was ornate in, in ancient Chinese. But these days it refers to culture or civilization or something like that. And uh, it's, it's blank today, but in the most ancient form of this symbol, it was a doodle of a man with a tattooed chest just like was worn by the, the dad in our Proto-Sino-Tibetan village. So essentially through the form of written Chinese, this ancient Neolithic past is preserved and in a way lives on even today. Pretty cool, huh? So that's all for today. Um, hope you enjoyed it. I really, this is one of the reasons I love Chinese because it's harking, is that the right word? Harkening, harking, whatever. But it's referring back to this ancient, ancient time in the Neolithic long, long ago, maybe even to that culture of the Proto-Sino-Tibetans themselves. So anyway, everybody, have a good day, and I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.